can give me a cue when you're ready. If I'd known I was going to be filmed, I would have prepared a better sermon. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I think we are all familiar with a certain saying. It goes like this. There is no pleasing some people. I think maybe that it should be said, there is no pleasing anyone. Do you ever get that feeling that everything you say or do will never really be enough for almost anyone? I know I do, and not just in terms of dealing with other people. I am my own worst critic. I expect things for myself that are not even humanly possible, but still I hurt, and I can't make them happen. Life is hard enough, but I think if we make it much harder by expecting so much of ourselves and of others. But we don't just expect things from other people. We expect the world to work in a certain way. And it can be very disappointing when it doesn't. Even something as beyond our control as the weather. So I just got back from South Dakota. And the last time I was there, the land was absolutely parched. There was no green grass to be found anywhere. The Grand River wasn't so grand, but a flowing at a trickle that I could just skip across. The land had suffered under a years long drought, and many friends, farmers, ranchers, and just folks who lived in the area confided in me that if we had one more summer like that, there would be a lot of people who had to give up their farms. Things were that dire. This year, when I returned for a visit, things were very different. The land was green, greener than I had ever seen it. The Grand River had overflowed just days before, and it even flooded some houses. Crops were growing, and there were no daily warm wildfire warnings, which was a welcome reprieve. It seemed to me that this could be a good thing. But what did I hear? Man, I wish this rain would stop. <laughs> we can't bail hay if the grass is that wet. <clears throat> or as the saying goes, a farmer is never happy. Of course, for those of you who have ever gardened, you know how fragile growing things can be. Too much rain, too little sun, too little rain, too much sun. There is always some crop that you grow that will not thrive under whatever conditions exist. And so we complain and join in the one thing that is common to every human being on Earth. We fetch, as some of our Yiddish-speaking neighbors would say. I'll refrain from using the less polite English equivalent of term. I think it's safe to say that historically, people have always been like this. Jesus points to it happening in his own time. He says, to what shall I compare this generation it is like children sitting around and calling to each other and saying, we played music for you and you didn't dance. We wailed and you didn't mourn. I think it's telling that he says this generation because people in later times can look back on it later and say, oh, it's, it's kind of like that even now. Because people, we haven't changed much in 2,000 years. And in many ways, we can often act like unsatisfied children. When I was a child, if Santa brought nine things that I wanted for Christmas, I was still wondering about the one toy I didn't get. There is no pleasing anyone, particularly children. Jesus continues saying, John came and he was in his head. He didn't drink or party. He didn't attend lavish feasts. So you folks say he's possessed by a demon. The man ate locusts and wild honey. Would you want to eat locusts and wild honey? I'm not sure if a demon possessed anyone who would want to eat locusts and wild honey. I mean, I know that the caveman diet is becoming a bit of a fad these days, but still. And Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton, and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So what Jesus is saying here, simply put, is damned if you do, damned if you don't. The expectations of others can be oppressive, and there is no pleasing anyone. There is also a subtle nuance that Jesus is pointing out here. Both John and Jesus were sent to preach the word of God, and yet the unreal expectations people had of God and his messengers 
led people of his time to disregard both Jesus and John. Because neither, neither Jesus nor John matched up to what they expected of a man of God. The crowds, like children, attacked Jesus and John's character. He's possessed by a demon. He hangs out with drunks. In other words, we don't have to listen to these guys because it doesn't matter what they say as long as we don't like them personally. But Jesus isn't buying that. He says, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In other words, God's work will be done with or without his critics' approval. In that light, I would hope that we can meditate together on the implications that such a statement has for today's world. Just in public discourse, whether in the media or on Capitol Hill, very often the first response of people is to say, I don't like this guy, so I don't have to listen to him. Did you hear what that lady said 10 years ago? Why should I care what she has to say? That person is friends with such and such a person, so can we really trust them? Our society is in the habit of judging people by their past and by their associations. And we often leave no room for forgiveness or compassion. Our leaders, our journalists, and even normal people, especially on Facebook, will resort to attack mode and character assassination without ever considering someone's words. I know that I personally can be very guilty of this. But to put it another way, I am friends with all sorts of unsavory characters. <laughs> I care for people who others I know would be embarrassed to spend even a moment with time with. Should I be disregarded because I chose to care for, people, uh, for unsavory people? Should I end friendships with those people for the sake of appearances? And like all people, I have a past, and I am often enough times embarrassed about it. I didn't always want to be a priest. Should the mistakes of my youth hang around my neck like a sign that says, don't listen to this man, he is a loyal screw-up. In that way, our expectations of our brothers and sisters can be violent and oppressive. To continue on that note, I remember that long before I ever began to formally discern my calling to the priesthood, I grappled with that decision for years. I would openly argue with God. I'd say, Lord, this must be a mistake. You can't possibly expect me, of all people, to become a priest. I name and even relive some of the most devastating failures of my life. I wallowed in my own shame. And I'd often say, Lord, please find someone else. I am the worst possible person to serve you. I will only drive people away. And that was my experience. I won't go into graphic detail, but I felt like I squandered all of my blessings to live a very meaningless life. I was in my late 20s, and I'd never amounted to much. I was living paycheck to paycheck, which was another way of saying that I was living for my weekends. I wanted to do nothing but escape and forget all the mistakes I'd ever made. And those mistakes lived with me. They moved into my house, they destroyed all of my things, and they kept me awake at night, mocking all I'd ever done and all I was ever going to do. So when God came knocking at my door and offered to clean up my mess, and asked, oh, by the way, how'd you like to be a priest? I thought God was crazy. I thought I was crazy. Did I really believe that God was calling me to be a priest? Did I dare to presume that I was worthy? I was afraid that no one would take me seriously, that people would see me not as a redeemed member of Christ's body, but as a screw-up who had ruined his own life. And in that way, I was also projecting my own expectations on other people. I couldn't forgive myself, so how could anyone else? Looking back, I have since learned that the voice of God, the mistakes that came to live with me, are not the voices I should listen to. As a dear friend says, fear is my brother. He goes with me everywhere, but I sure won't be listening to his counsel. God calls who God calls. And who am I? Crushing God. God calls us, all of us, and offers to lift our burdens. He offers to free us from the unreasonable expectations of others and our own oppressive demands on ourselves. He gives us rest. We live in a world populated by billions of people, and each of those human beings has his or her own set of expectations. Is it any wonder, then, that the world is so often contentious, violent, and demoralizing. 
We all want to believe God is on our side, and this canon has led nations to invade other nations, people to oppress other peoples. We only need look at American history to see the terrible result of the human need to impose its collective will upon others. We've seen the genocide of the American Indian and the enslavement of African people. Today, we suffer under the endless debates between liberals and conservatives. We fight wars in foreign countries. And everyone on any side of any conflict believes that God is on their side. It is only human nature to want to be right. Jesus has no time for this way of thinking. He says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. I cannot think of a more emphatic way of saying, no, my friends, God is not on your side. God is on God's side. No one knows the Father except the Son. So how can we presume to try to impose our will on others, or even on ourselves? Jesus is speaking to the crowds who expected the impossible of Jesus and John. But he's also speaking to us. He wants us to be aware of the peril of being right all the time. The peril of ignoring people we don't want to agree with. He wants us to be aware of the peril of demanding more of others than they can actually give to us. By contrast, in today's readings, we are given a very different picture of what God's kingdom looks like. It is not like earthly kingdoms. Rather than haughty demands, our king will ride in on a donkey and be humble. And this is a stark contrast with the war horses and chariots that Zechariah, in today's reading, says that God will dispose of. Rather than war, his dominion will be one of peace. Zechariah also says that God will set the prisoners free. Prisoners are captives, people who are oppressed and enslaved by others, and our God has no truck with oppression. The psalmist says something similar. He says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. He is good to all and has compassion for all that he has made. The Lord upholds all who are fallen and raises up those who are bowed down. God will not let people be bowed under the weight of the world. God lightens our load and frees us from the unreasonable demands that the world often places on us and we so very often place on ourselves. And how will God do this? Zechariah said he will do so humbly riding in on a donkey. But what does that look like? It looks like, according to Jesus, an invitation. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus did not ride in on a chariot and demand that people serve him. Jesus had no truck with tyranny or oppression. Jesus extends an invitation. He says, come to me, not I will conquer you. He says, I will give you rest, not I will make unreasonable demands of you. Can any of us imagine what that actually looks like? How hard is it to set down that burden? How hard is it to leave behind all we have done and all we suspect others think of us? Even more pointedly, how hard is it for us to stop expecting of others more than they can give? Can we accept and even love those who do not live the way we would like them to? Jesus dined with tax collectors and sinners. Can we invite the undesirables of today into our own homes? And can we make those who live in our homes and our neighborhoods feel less undesirable? We are called to follow Jesus. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> In trying to live like Christ, I pray that today we can begin to lighten the loads we put on others. And I pray doubly that we can lighten the burden we put on ourselves. Let us, who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, turn to Jesus, for he will give us rest. Amen. Amen.